Hey everybody, welcome to the very first episode of the Tim Ballard podcast. Now we thought long and hard about what we should do for this very first episode. We, we're going to have lots of guests, um, but the thing that I think more than anything else that inspired us to even start this podcast was the amazing amount of attention that the new film Sound of Freedom is getting. Um, my understanding from Angel Studios, who's distributing this film, that tells the story of our rescue mission and how it began and the very first uh, rescues we, we did, um, they're telling me that they're even record-breaking box office pre-sales. Um, they've never seen so many people um, buying tickets so far in advance. So uh, I thought to myself, well, if, if, if I'm an audience member, if I'm going to watch this movie, at the end of the movie, any movie that's based on a true story, um, I know what people ask. I've sat in the theater uh, presenting after the movie. What's real? What's not real? And so I'm going to take some time here without uh, giving any spoiler alerts. I'm a little concerned. I don't want to give anything away. So I'll be careful not to do that. Um, and it'll be fun to watch this even before the film and especially after the film. So this episode is Artifacts and History of Sound of Freedom, What is True and What's Not. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, with a scene that is extremely emotional for me in the in the film. It was filmed at the very place where this happened. Now, what, what happened was uh, a little boy, five years old, a Hispanic kid, um, was being trafficked uh, by an American man um, across the southern border at the Calexico, California, uh, east or west port of entry. And I remember the night I got the call, uh, we, we, we showed up there and there's this little boy. Now it was the first time I've been working child crimes for quite some time. This was the first time ever that I actually saw a real child. Um, and not only any child, but a child that I had seen before in a video, in a child rape video. And the, and the video is actually showing this man, this, this, this horrible human being, uh, his name is Earl Buchanan. He's in jail now for the rest of his life, I, I hope. Um, and he, it shows him uh, sexually assaulting this, this, this child. I mean, the video went on for like 20, 30 minutes. It was horrifying. And then there's the kid. There's the kid. And, and that, it's kind of what kicks off the, the, the adventure, the story. Because, uh, and, and by the way, Sound of Freedom is very careful. You're not going to see anything. Um, I told them, I said, when you make this film, you can't show anything that would whet the appetite or make salivate a pedophile. So you don't see any scenes like that. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, also, they did it in a way that you know what it is. It's, you're going to feel it. You're going to know what it is. But they're, so, they're such storyteller geniuses that they, they were able to pull it off. So don't, don't think you're going to see like that video. But that's, that's a true story. And then the, and then the little boy um, told us, where his sister was and that she had also been trafficked and then boom it, that's kind of it goes into to the 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 story and that's how the film kicks off i, I think it, it's relevant for a few things i want to touch on a couple of cool um, um kind of insights one when when they filmed this even when this event happened i never knew that the southern border was going to be so incredibly um you know uh, uh political and and, and controversial it's, it shouldn't be controversial right um you know the, the whole thing with the building in, enforcement building barriers walls wall became almost a curse word and what's interesting about that um is the, the democrats built more of the wall than the republicans that's the truth if you do some research you'll find that the clinton administration built a huge chunk of it and 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 then you know george w bush also and but the, the it's not political it's the same concept as a museum or the same concept as a, a theater or uh, any kind of a, you know, amusement park. You, you need to control the flow of people. And, and even more importantly than controlling the flow of people into a concert, it's people into this country. And when I say people, I'm thinking about children. I'm thinking about that little boy, that five-year boy you're going to see in this movie. Why was he rescued? Because of the wall. You know, I, I, I once heard a, a politician say, we, all, most of the seizures of drugs or rescues of children happen at the ports of entry. That's where it's happening. We don't need to build the wall. It happens at the port of entry. And I thought, really? Like, two plus two equals four. Like, you don't understand this? There's no such thing as a port of entry without a wall. 
it forces people like Earl Buchanan to bring his victims through a place where people are watching. Trained people are watching. Trained uniformed women and men who are looking for children who are being trafficked. The United States, we're the number one consumer of child exploitation material almost every year. We're in the top three for destination countries for human trafficking. So the, the economy of it tells you that traffickers want to get kids into our country. And so if that's what we understand, why wouldn't we, for the kids' sake, why wouldn't we want to have border enforcement so we can have a better chance of catching the bad guys and rescuing the kids? See, we, we see it all wrong because, because of what people call it Trump uh, derangement syndrome. And love him or hate him, it's true. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's because he wanted it, it had to be bad. So they created something where it was, oh, keep, keep um, you know, foreign people, foreign kids out of the country. No. It's the other way around. We're trying to keep foreign children from falling into the pedophile grasp and predatory behavior of Americans on the other side of that wall. You're seeing it all all wrong if you if you don't understand this concept. And people in the high, highest places of this government do not understand it because they're facilitating more. They're not they're not enforcing the border. It's 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 incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly insulting. Um, to our, our intelligence, but mostly to children who could be being rescued, but instead, come on in. Come on in and, and your trafficker can just walk you across the border. And in fact, we'll pay for the last leg of it. Just get the kid into the country and he can be unaccompanied. There's been over 200,000 unaccompanied minors um, who have come across the border just in the last few years. And they come across, and thousands of them are under five years old. So and they come across, I've been there, they come across with a little name, their sponsor, you know, John Smith, here's his phone number, and the, the government officials are forced to call the number and say, we got this kid, is he yours? Yes, he's mine. No vetting, no DNA test, no background check. Um, they used to have to come pick the kid up. Now our taxpayer dollars put, them on, put the kids on a bus, on a plane, and send them to the sponsor. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's heart-wrenching what's going on, but th those are some of the thoughts that come to me when I think about that, that very pivotal scene in the movie that, 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 that reflects a real thing that happened, again, filmed in the very same place um, that it happened at the Calexico, California West Port of Entry. So um, another scene happens in this film. You're going to see, even in the trailer, you see uh, actor Jim Caviezel, who plays me in the film, he's carrying a, a necklace with him a lot. He has this necklace, and you know it means something. Now, when, when, the, when the filmmakers came to me and showed me the script, I told them that, if I were them, I would take that out. I wouldn't talk about the necklace because no one's going to believe the story. If you tell the true story about that necklace, no one's going to believe it. They're going to think it's fiction and um, just be okay with that. Um, why do I say that? Because after the little boy was rescued and I was one of the first on the scene, I, I, it was my case ultimately, and I was investigating the case, um, a, the little boy gave me the necklace that his sister had given him. And it was like their prayer is their rosary. And it... I was trying to try to give it back to him and he gave it back to me and he made me keep it. Only later did I realize that my name was on the necklace. And all of a sudden it meant a ton to me. It was one of my own children who was about the same age as that little boy who found the necklace in my office and said, oh, that's cool that, you know, they put your name on this, you know? And, and I said, what are you talking about? Sure enough, I flipped the necklace around and, and it, it says 1 Timothy 6.11, it's a scripture. And so that might just be a coincidence to some of you, but not, it didn't feel like that to me. It felt like something special. And when I told that story to the uh, filmmakers, they loved it. And that's why they included it in there. And um, in the movie, the kids end up with the necklace. Um, and it kind of, the movie ends with them having it. Uh, but in actuality, they never took it back. And I still have it. In fact, I'm wearing it right now. This is the actual necklace that you'll see depicted in the film. They, they changed the style of it. It looks a little different. But my name is still on it. And... This is the necklace. I'm going to have Alejandro Monteverde, the director of the film, on in, a, in an episode coming up. And I'm going to shock him with some of these artifacts from the movie, things he's never even seen before, even though he's intimately connected to it. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's the story of the necklace, the, 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 the southern border. Now, we're, it's important to understand this because I want to be very upfront and honest. Uh, those kids are real. So when people, when people ask me how much of this movie is, is real, how much of it is false, I'll answer this way. Every kid is a real kid, okay, um, that you see in the film. Every bad guy is a real bad guy. In fact, before they had to edit it for the theatrical release, 
there was cards at the end that showed you the good guys and the bad guys where they are today. They're all real characters. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that and it's, it's, and, and you'll see what happened to each of the bad guys, how much time they got in jail and so forth. That was taken off the film, but it just, it just goes to show that yes, it's real. However, these kids are still real kids and they're, they're, they're not, they're still minors. Okay. So we, we're not going to tell the exact story of what happened to those kids. I'll tell you this much, whatever happened to them in the film, the reality was worse. So in fact, if you followed the real story, you would find that the kids ended up being abused in the United States. Um, uh, not necessarily just in Colombia or in Colombia. Um, and that brings it home even more, but I didn't let them do it. I didn't let them tell, be true to that story the whole time because eventually we have to protect identities. Um, so what did they do? They merged other real stories into it. Um, one of those real stories they merged into it was what you see in the movie described as the island raid. Um, again, I don't want to spoiler alert, but there's a part in the film where you'll see we're on this beautiful island out of, off of Cartagena um, Bay, and it's a real story. Uh, it's it's an amazing story. Uh, it's it's one where we ended up with 54 kids. Um, some were adults, most were kids or young, you know, young adults, 18 down to I think the youngest was 11 or 12. And it was it ended up being this raid on this island. It was a, a, a totally um, undercover operation. We infiltrated this organization and ultimately were able to rescue 54 kids. Um, it's a very emotional scene. Um, I only got to the set twice. Um, I, I, you know, cause it's so, it takes like four or five months. Um, uh, and the scenes I chose to go to were the one about my family where my wife's depicted. I wanted to make sure I was there for that. And then the Island, the Island raid was super important for me to be there. Um, and this is very emotional. I remember being on set, just sobbing as they, as, cause they actually filmed it. I think a couple of kilometers from where it, the Island were actually happened. So very, very intense, um, for me. And emotional for me to, to watch that now some things of course are, are exaggerated some they, they take liberties as they do and i always told them like if you take liberties you can but i'm not going to pretend if you make me look like like way more amazing than what than, than what i am or what i did i'm going to be honest about it um and i'll get to some of those things in a second but this island raid was actually something that was underreported in the film because it wasn't just 54 rescues, it was over 120 rescues uh, on that, in that day, on that very day, within an hour or two time. It was in three countries, I'm sorry, it was in three cities within Colombia. And I'm not gonna get into that, to, not to spoil alert, the documentary that's gonna be coming out on the heels of Center of Freedom called Triple Take. And you're gonna learn all about what actually happened there is way more amazing, way more exciting, and, and informative about how human trafficking works. So we're super excited to put that out so you can learn about it. And now at the end of the movie, um, you're gonna see some real footage, including the real footage that you, that, you know, that was depicted in the movie. Um, in fact, because of that, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little insight into, into Jim Caviezel and why he's the guy that plays me in the film. When they came to me, um, yeah, I believe it was December of 2017, and they said, we're going to film the movie. And I couldn't believe it because uh, I didn't think they were ever going to do it. I, I researched this. I think something like less than 5% of movies that, go, that are in concept phase end up on the big screen. So they said, no, we're filming, and, and we have to pick an actor to play you quick. we got to commit somebody. You don't get to pick, but we'll listen to you. I said, Jim Caviezel. I said, why? I, I said, because, um, well, first they said no. Not because he's not an excellent actor, but they said, look, we have this concept in the script that at the end it flips over and you see real footage. And you and Jim couldn't look any, any more different, you know. Um, and I said, I don't care. You have, to, you have to fix that in the makeup room if you want to. But I need someone who loves Jesus. That was important to me. And if you look at all the actors out there, I don't know how many do. But I know Jim Caviezel does. He, he sacrificed his whole career um, to play that, that, that role in one of the highest grossing films of all time, The Passion of the Christ. And he, of course, played the role of Jesus. Um, and, and so when I think of that footage at the end, and you'll see there's a couple little surprises, um, how, they sh how they go from the movie and kind of morph it into, um, into the real footage. But in the end, I think they did a decent job uh, making him look at least somewhat like me. So you can be the judge when, 
when 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 you watch it. Um, another scene in the film that I think is well, actually, back to the island. Um, during the island raid, you're going to see in the real footage, you're going to see me wearing a hat as I'm being arrested on the beach. This is the real footage. The hat is the hat of Che Guevara. And you might think that that's not something that I would wear. But let me tell you the story behind that. Um, one of the bad guys in the film, um, his name was Fuego. He called himself Fuego. Um, and he, so in the real operation, which went down on October 11th of 2000. And 14, you can look up a CBS News, Scott Pelley um, did a whole story on it in the wake of it, of it happening. Um, but as Fuego was bringing the kids to the island, he was wearing that hat. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna, I'm, I want that hat as a souvenir. If things go as we're planning, he's going to be arrested. And I want that hat. Um, and, and so I went up to him right before I knew the arrest was about to happen. And of course, he didn't know anything. I walked up to him and just said, hey, want, want to swap hats? I want to try this one out. So I gave him my hat and then I, I, I wore his hat. And that's, it's, so you see me wearing that hat uh, in the real footage when I, when I get arrested or fake arrested. And here is the artifact. This is the actual hat. I'm, again, you guys, you got to tune in to my interview with Alejandro Monteverde. I'm going to show him all these things. I don't even think he knows they exist. Um, another of my favorite scenes, like I'm, I'm going my top three scenes, okay? Uh, the, 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 the border scene, the island scene. And this one I just love. It's, it's towards the beginning of the film. And it's a true story of, of a guy they, they call in the film Oshensky. Um, he, is, he was one of the more prolific uh, collectors of child exploitation material that I've ever seen. He had over 2 million pieces, as I recall, of, of that material. And it was an interesting case because he, he was very intellectual. He'd written a lot about pedophilia, justifying it, making even legal arguments for it. Um, he had written a book. Um, the book was about a character from ancient Greece, I believe, um, who was a real person, not a pedophile, but he just used that as the, as the, as the pretext to write every third page is another sex scene with a child. And, and he put that out, selling it on Amazon, First Amendment protected, um, and it, it was out there. And I, and I had read that book um, before we took him down. Um, the movie doesn't get into how we found him, but he does play a pivotal uh, role in the in the film Sound of Freedom. And by the way, the actor that plays him looks almost the spitting image of him. It, it kind of creeped me out because he, he was to me kind of a creepy guy um, for, for many reasons, but even how he acted and how he spoke. And I remember interrogating him after we arrested him and he just would not, he just would not break. He wouldn't talk. And he had, he had hidden all of his, all of his hard drives that we, we know contained what would be over 2 million pieces of material. And um, I decided to try something crazy that I'd never tried before because I'd read so much of his material and he, I, I believed that he believed that men naturally are attracted to children, that that's, that's the apex of their beauty. And they only go downhill from there after puberty. He wrote about these things. And so I thought, well, if he really believes that, then he must think that I must struggle with it because I'm exposed to child exploitation material all the time. So I, I told my partner, I'm like, walk away from the table. I'll, ha I'll have the camera or I'll have the microphone under, under my vest. And he says, it's never going to work. He'll never buy it. Well, it, it took me like 45 minutes and I got him to buy it. And all of a sudden there's a bond with us. All of a sudden, we're buddies. All of a sudden, he's confessing things. And I'm not going to give any more away. Um, the filmmakers obviously couldn't spend 45 minutes setting up how I did that. And so I was like, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do something convincing to convince the audience that I was able to make him believe that I was Tim Ballard's special agent, hidden pedophile? And they came up with a brilliant idea. I'm not going to tell you what it is, um, but they're able to tell the whole thing in three or four minutes. And you're like, okay, wow, he, he, he pulled that off. Um, later on, he gets arrested, um, true to the, the real account. He's in a cafe. Um, I had gotten all the information I needed on being undercover as myself for, for a period of time, I want to say a month or two. Um, and then we met him at a coffee shop and um, that's where he was arrested. I told them like, once I give you the sign, you can come take him. Um, at the coffee shop, true story, he gave me a copy of his book and he made an inscription to me. Um, you'll see it represented. You'll see some ancient kind of Greek character in the book. And it doesn't give you any context in the movie. Just It just has the name of the person from the ancient history. And, and then Jim Caviezel opens the book and reads the inscription. 
Um, well, I'm so excited, again, to show this to Alejandro. I never have, but this is a copy of the actual book. And in the movie, Jim, um, in the movie, Jim will um, open up the book and something is inside there that will shock you and launches you further into the journey, but I'll let you see that when you watch the movie. And here's the inscription from this guy. Um, it just says, you know, Tim Ballard lived well to Agent Ballard. Um, and so this, this is another important artifact uh, from, from the film. Um, now, um, as you get towards the end of the movie, the, the, it gets really exciting. And I got to be very careful. Um, I, in fact, I don't want to even tell you the very, very end um, because it, I don't know how to do it without being a total um, plot spoiler. Uh, but I'll say that um, the place that I go is real. It's a real place. It's a target location still, so it's not something we would actually tell you where it is. And, you know, and, and the producers may hate me for saying this, but I, I don't, I just, I want to be transparent. A lot of things happened um, that made me look way more badass than I am in, in the last 15 minutes of the movie, okay? So um, I, I, I'm not going to say what those things are because I'll be giving up, but I, after, I'll address it later. But um, yeah, that's all. I just want to say that. But, but the most important part of that, of that scene is the place is real and there's still kids in that place. Um, and uh, we still are making efforts to to infiltrate and 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 make rescues there. So, uh, so we'll come back to that. Now, that's just a little teaser. There's so much more, um, but I want to end by telling you um, what you can do with all this. Now, Angel Studios is amazing. I mean, they're so creative, and they know that the key to ending modern day slavery is storytelling. It always is. The storytellers change the culture, change the people, right? make the people rise up. Government starts shifting. They start prioritizing. Right now, I think it's like five U.S. drug agents to one anti-trafficking agent. That needs a swap. But in, in a republic like ours, it, it, it flops and switches and becomes better when the people get loud. We can't do that. We can do rescues. Um, we've rescued thousands of people. And I, I'm the founder of, of one of those organizations that has rescued over 7,000 and, and, and participated in, in the arrest of, of 5,000 plus, um, or maybe 4,000 uh, traffickers and pedophiles. Uh, and and I, I'm the CEO currently of another organization called the Nazarene Fund. We, we fight human trafficking um, with a focus in the Middle East and, and Africa and, and we're going around the world, but the focus there is what's happening to religious minorities. If you're Christian or Yazidi or some place where you're beat up because of how you believe, the focus is that. And I love the Nazarene Fund. I mean, we, we've taken down just recently organ harvesting rings of babies. And you can check my social media. We'll probably do a whole story on that someday. And I love that. I love those organizations. Um, but I'm going to introduce you to another organization that I, I sit on the, the Board of Governors. In fact, I'm the president of the Board of Governors. And it's a different concept. It doesn't take away from, from OUR, the Nazarene Fund. Um, but it, what it does is it includes everybody. Because we're really serious about rescuing children the best way. And there's not, even the ones I founded or run aren't necessarily the best in every single category. There might be a project, I'll give you an example. There was, when, 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 you, when Russia uh, invaded Ukraine last year in February, um, I got a, a phone call from Mel Gibson who told me that he's got names of kids in Ukraine who are orphans and he, was, he feared for their lives. Um, I had another list that my wife had given me because we were um, we were adopting children out as part of the OUR program, Children Needs, Needs Families. They were being adopted out of potential trafficking situations. And there were, I think, seven or six kids, and Catherine was very concerned about them. Uh, so um, both Catherine and Mel Gibson <laughs> were both my, my two witnesses that we need to go to Ukraine. Well, look, OUR is amazing. OUR is in five regions and they're up to their eyeballs, as they should be, in work. To, to ask them to veer off from this or that, to go into Ukraine, I mean, I, I started to, I'm like, I can't even do that, I don't wanna do that. But there was another organization that was able to, the Nazarene Fund, and also Aerial Recovery, 
which is another partner organization. So we were able to mobilize funds, resources, attention, and get the people in place. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even either of my foundations that led out. It was area recovery. And I, I learned the concept. This is very important. There are organizations all over the world. Some are really small, but they're dedicated to just one region. And if something goes down like a war or an earthquake or a hurricane, or you, you never know what can happen, but all of those things make children vulnerable. Whenever children are vulnerable, that's harvest time for human traffickers. And I have to have the ability to move quick, to deploy resources. And that me might mean that it's some organization I've never even heard of, but I vetted them and I find out that they can do the job. Boom, they're going to get the resources. And so that's why we're creating this kind of umbrella organization. And we call it the Spear Fund. The idea being it's the tip of the spear. It moves fast. And it also employs kind of a capitalistic kind of free market feel to it which is whoever's the best at doing a certain thing, you're going to get the project because we care about the kids more than any single institution, even the ones that I run or I founded. We care about the kids first and foremost. A lesson I learned in Ukraine. It's effective. It works. The SPEAR Fund also is, is an acronym for the principles we believe in. Like S is spirituality. Uh, e or P is peace because ultimately that's what we want in the world and for children. E is education. Education is one of the greatest weapons. The sound of freedom being a, a, a weapon of mass instruction and education. Um, and we want that out there. So education, A, action. Yes, we will deploy operatives. We will partner with or deploy in, in some way or another operati operators, undercover operators, uh, any kind of operator that required to get kids out and save their lives. And then the R is redemption. Redemption, not just for the kids, but even for the bad guys, you know, and we can tr try to make the world a better place by eliminating them uh, or eliminating the evil spirits in, in, these, in these people. And, and we, we hope they could be redeemed. Uh, also, another concept, um, I've partnered with this brand, Attract. I love this brand. You'll see me wearing this shirt all the time. Um, Attract is a brand that's all about bringing people of light to bring them together. Um, and it's, it's, we, we live in the most divisive time. It's insane. Everything's politicized. Human trafficking is politicized. Like I said, the border is so politicized. It never was. I was an agent for 10 years on that border. And it was never political. And now it is. So we just love to hate. We love to hate it. We love the dopamine hit, I think, we get. Even if the headline doesn't match the story, who cares? The headline was enough to give me the dopamine hit I wanted to hate on someone. And we got to stop that. And the reason I love this brand Attract is because it's about finding the commonality. Where are the points of light that we all share that transcend politics, religion, race, anything? And I thought, well, there's, there's one thing, maybe the last thing on the table that everybody can agree on except for traffickers and pedophiles. And that is this, a tagline of Saturn Freedom, maybe the most important line that Jim Caviezel says, God's children are not for sale. And so the R in, this, in Spear is about redemption of all of us. We found something. We found something that we can all agree is bad. We found something that will allow us to drop our stupid, petty, tribal, you know, blue versus red or whatever, religion versus religion. Drop it for a second. Lock arms around this one thing. That's redemptive. That's redemptive. And it brings, back to the beginning, peace. And it's, it begins this beautiful cycle of help, of peace, of redemption, um, through education and through action. So the Spear Fund is a place that you can go to be part of this umbrella solution. I have some big VIPs who sit with me on the Board of Governors, and I'll tell you about them um, soon in a, in, a, in, a, in a future show. But if you really want to get involved in that way, in a way that helps, again, OUR, the Nazarene Fund, and, and, and so many other organizations, go to thespearfund.org and donate, support, help us. Come up with ways that we can get more people there. Um, we have the experts at the top, the experts. Um, I'm bringing in, I'm bringing in these experts and we will make these decisions. And sometimes they're snap decisions. What do we do? How do we deploy resources? Let's go now, let's save these keys now. There's no time. There's no time to wait give to, you know, wait through some bureaucratic situation in, in any given organization or agency. We can move now. That's the spear fund, the tip of the spear. Be part of the solution. Be part of the tip of the spear. So thank you guys so much. That wraps up our, our very first episode of the Tim Ballard podcast. And again, 
I encourage you to look at the links and, and the website of all the different organizations that you can fund. And um, if you want to learn more about what we're heading up uh, in, in this most recent kind of tip of the spear solution, be part of it. Be part of that spear. Go to uh, thespearfund.org. I'll see you there. And I'll see you on the next episode of the Tim Ballard Podcast. <laughs>